Hey, welcome to our New York Giants Preservation Society meeting for today, November 19, 2024, with author Tom uh, Halforth. Tom has a great new book called Perfect Eloquence uh, about Vin Scully. Um, I am so sorry. Well, some of you might be happy. I ran out of ink because I think the cover is in Dodger blue. So not all of it is in Dodger <laughs> blue. So I think many of you will be happy about that. But we'll get back to this in a minute. Let me just go over some uh, other things. First of all, happy uh, pre-Thanksgiving to all of you. Um, there will be no meeting next week due to the holiday. We will reconvene on Thursday, December 5th with John uh, Ianna Marino, who will be talking about the uh, 1962 World Series between the Giants and the Yankees. Now, you may ask why. <laughs> well, a lot of Giant fans in here in San Francisco. Plus, there were many, many New York Giants who were playing and on the roster in 1962. A uh, couple of other things. Uh, I don't know if Tom is aware. Next, um, next Wednesday on MLB Network, Sounds of the Game will be Vin Scully. And tomorrow, one of our favorite announcers the best announcer who is alive today. John Miller will be the uh, sounds of the game at uh, three o'clock. I spoke to him today. I was hoping he might hop aboard. We shall see. <laughs> uh, lastly, um, I was in contact with the Sabre Landmark Committee. Again, I am trying my darndest to get the signage fixed at the polo grounds. And we're also thinking about adding a marker for where Willie Mays' apartment uh, was on 80th, 80 St. Nicholas Place, or now called 80th Willie Mays Place. Uh, so without further ado, you might say, why, why <laughs> have somebody come and speak about Vin Scully? Well, our in here is that Vin grew up as a New York Giant fan. So we'll yeah. leave it at that. Uh, and everybody knows he is just, he was the quintessential baseball announcer. And I'm going to uh, turn it over to Tom. Tom, welcome to the New York Giants Preservation Site. Everybody, Tom. I'm impressed, I'm impressed with your size and greatness. <laughs> we, have a, we have a great group here, Tom. And I hope that one day when you're not speaking, you hop aboard. Maybe somebody will be of interest of you to hear. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, the, the thing about this book is mostly it's not a biography or a tribute. It's really an appreciation of his life and the way he treated people, the way he was obviously a great broadcaster and storyteller, but more about the man himself. So I thought that that was kind of important to point out. But in the course of putting this together through my 30 years of working as a sports journalist and knowing him and having interviews with him, it was easy to reach out to people and get their opinions about him. And so I've collected a lot of stories as well that didn't get in the book. And I found a few in particular that I think you guys would be interested in the, based on the Dodger giant rivalry. And again, his connection with Willie Mays, who probably made his weekend during his last uh, three broadcasts at uh, in San Francisco, where Willie joined him in the booth and they have a plaque up there now. And just this great picture of Vin taking Willie's hand and, kind of putting it over the lettering so he could understand what the plaque was all about. So those two are really tied together in history. Uh, so, so Gary, what would you like me to do? Do you want to ask well, why, why don't you tell, to kind of why, do a little presentation or? Why don't you tell us, you know, more in depth about the book? Do you want to read a little bit or talk about some of the, the people in here? And then people will uh, ask you questions about the book and, you know, we'll, we'll plug the book to see, you know, we'll ask you where we can get it. And sure. Well, let me, t I, I pulled out about four or five stories that I thought you guys would be interested in. The first one was I found in 2017, the library of Congress posted an interview and a recording that Scully had from the 1957 last game at, at, uh, between the Dodgers and the Giants was in the Polo Grounds, September 8th, 1957, before they both moved to California. And the quote that Vin is recorded as saying is, I don't know how you feel about it at the other end of these microphones, 
whether you're sitting at home or driving in a car or on the beach or anywhere. But I know sitting here watching the Giants and Dodgers apparently playing for the last time at the Polo Grounds, you want them to take their time. And even he understood the gravity of the, the, the situation and the fact that these two teams were being taken to a whole new place and, and so many fans were just didn't want it to end. So I thought that was pretty poignant. Um, here's another story I found out about the Dodgers and the Giants. Uh, there's a new baseball book out. Sabre did a new book in July called Dodger Stadium Blue Heaven on Earth. And chapter 13 is all about Vin Scully. And um, the the guy who wrote this piece is named Michael Green. He's a historian who uh, teaches history at UNLV, and he did a, an essay for this book. And one of the essays, one of the uh, things he resourced for his piece was a 1970 L.A. Times column by John Hall. And <laughs> Scully admitted one of the only occasions he can remember when he vented his support for the Dodgers. He was very much known as a guy who played it down the middle. And with more research, I think we tracked down the game. It was a 1962 Dodger Giant playoff game, a three-game series they had. And what had happened was... Vin said that the tremendous animal war, roar of the crowd got to me. I felt like I was going to explode. I had to do something. So I leaned out of the booth and I started pounding my fist on the facade of the stadium. None of the listeners knew what I was doing because he had pressed the cough button on his microphone. But when he finally got the fist pounding out of my system, I resumed announcing as calmly as I could. And one of the people asked me later, how in the world could I stay so cool and detached during such an exciting game? And I kind of wanted to go over that game with you. It was all Vin, all that Vin remembered is that was the Dodger outfielder Lee Walls hit a pinch hit triple. And what really happened was it was the second game of the 62 playoffs, Dodgers Giants. Um, and Dodgers needed the win to force a third game. And it's the sixth inning, and the Dodgers were losing five to nothing. Uh, Walls came up as a pinch hitter and double to score two runs, and then he went to third on the throw, so that's why I think Vin thought it was a triple, and that gave the Dodgers a 6-5 to five lead. When I went to the box score of that game, I couldn't believe how much history was compacted into those last few innings. On the very next play, Walls scored on a fielder's choice on a ground ball hit by Maury Wills, but what happened was Walls injured Giants catcher Tom Haller on the play, knocking him out of the game. Um... And then after Walls hit in the sixth inning, the Giants decided to bring in a relief pitcher, Don Larson, who, of course, seven years earlier was much more famous at pitching against the Dodgers. But it's just great how that name kind of came back up again. Um, the Giants ended up tying that game in the eighth inning. Um, and, and during their rally, Willie Mays was actually thrown out trying to go from second to third on a run scoring base hit. Tommy Davis, who was playing center field, as Willie Davis was substituted out, was actually the one who threw him out, which is kind of surprising. And the Dodgers won in the bottom of the ninth with Ron Fairley hit a line drive sacrifice fly to center field with the bases loaded. Willie Mays could not throw out Maury Wills at home plate. I mean, that's that was asking a lot, but but it was just a, in, in a, a, such an exciting game. And the next game, obviously, you guys know the Giants scored four in the top in the ninth and eliminated the Dodgers six to four. And uh, Don Larson actually got the win in relief of Juan Marichal. And uh, again, that was uh, such a, such a great way to end it with, again, with the Dodgers trying to figure out who to pitch in that ninth inning, whether Drysdale's warming up and there's, you know, Ron, Ron Paranoski and Stan Williams trying to close out that game. So um, that to me was, was just a, a cool thing to do when during research, for a book like this, you kind of pull out these stories and you get to relive the games a little bit and jog your memory. Um, one of the things that Vince Scully told Willie Mays when Willie came in to visit uh, during that last uh, homestand in 2016 was obviously, Vince said, everybody remembers your 1954 World Series catch at the Polo Grounds against Vic Wirtz. But Vince said, you know, I think the greatest catch I ever saw you made was the Dodgers' home opener in 1952. And I wondered if any of you guys remembered about that game. So, yeah, all right, some of you do. That's good. Here's what happened was, and Scully's memory, again, was a little bit foggy, but again, it was worth looking up to see what had happened. 
The way Sculling remembered it is the Giants held a 7-6 to six lead against the Dodgers in the bottom of the ninth at Ebbets Field. Two outs, bases loaded, and Brooklyn's Bobby Morgan drove a line drive to center field that would have won the game for the Dodgers. But as Scully told Mays, he goes, you hit the warning track, you hit your head on the concrete wall, you rolled over on your back, and you held the ball in your glove on your chest. And then Henry Thompson came over, reached in, took the ball out of your glove, held it up in the air, and they called Bobby out. And that was the end of the game, the greatest catch I ever saw. And Mays said, well, nobody ever talks about that. And Scully said, well, I do all the time. <laughs> but here's actually what happened for some of you guys who know better. Uh, actually, that the interesting part, too, is that was Scully's third year in the booth. He was 24 years old. And that was the start of May's second season uh, in the big leagues. And he was in a month, he would turn 21. And of course, 1951, he was the rookie of the year. But that year, 1952, he'd only play 34 games because he was drafted into the Korean War. Um, so for the record, um, what happened was the Dodgers had swept an opening game series in Boston in 1952. The Giants split two games against Philadelphia in their opener at the Polo Grounds. So then they met for the Dodgers home opener on a Friday afternoon. It was their first meeting since the Bobby Thompson shot her around the world game. So it was it was lots of eyes were on this one. It's the start of Mays' rookie season. So in the bottom of the seventh, what actually happened, not the ninth inning, the Giants were ahead six to four. Uh, Andy Pafko at homeward with two outs to make it six to five. Uh, Gil Hodges singled, Carl Ferrillo walked, and so the bases weren't low. They were two on, and that brought up Morgan to pinch hit for Car pitcher Carl Erskine. And what happened was he he hit that ball that Mays caught, hit his head on the concrete, and, and showed that it was out. The Dodgers ended up tying that game on Jackie Robinson's solo homer in the bottom of the eighth, and they won the game in the bottom of the twelfth on Pafko's second homer of the game. So, again, I think Vin had a few things you know, mixed up, but that's the great part about having these box scores for history. You can kind of go back and read the the, the pitch by pitch on a lot of these things. And it's just amazing to hear uh, how someone's memory can get clouded. Just you imagine Mays and 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 the, the Giants played the Dodgers, you know, hundreds of times. I think Willie Mays of his 660 home runs, almost 100 of them came off the Dodgers. And uh, 13 of them were off of uh, Don Drysdale alone. Uh, he And Mays actually hit 309 lifetime against the Dodgers over 21 years. So it was it's it's probably fitting that Scully called Mays the greatest player I ever saw because he was probably the most frequent great, greatest player he ever saw. Um, uh, I remember a game when I was a kid, 1971. I was 10 years old. And the Dodgers were marking the 20th anniversary of Willie Mays' Major League debut. And I think he was also turning 40 that season. And they had this big display at home plate with 20 cakes to celebrate his 20th year. And I was a kid and I could not believe how the Dodgers would treat someone like Willie Mays or like anybody from the Giants, let alone Willie Mays, to this such a celebration. And again, what I found out was going to happen was uh, Mays had actually, in that series, tied Stan Musial's record for most uh, career runs scored. And if he was if he was to break that record, uh, the Dodgers had planned to dig up home plate for them at Dodger Stadium and give it to him as a gift. But what happened was um, Don Sutton held May's hit list in four at-bats in the series finale, so he never got to break the record there. So he had to do it later. Um but anyway, those are kind of the stories that I, I really thought was interesting <clears throat> to tie the two together. And um, I tried to track down as many different people for this book to get their stories about Ben Scully. I was lucky enough to get Bob Costas and Al Michaels, Peter O'Malley, the Dodger owner. Um, I didn't get, um, oh, I'm, I'm blanking on his name. The uh, Oh, I thought I would see it here. The writer who did the uh, the Willie Mays book recently from San Francisco. John Shea. Yeah, John Shea. John was great in giving me a good blurb for the book. And um, so all in all, I think it, it came together really nice and it pays a nice 
appreciation for Vin. And I know that I, it would be great to hear John Miller do a few of his Vin lines because they're so, <laughs> so great. Um, but you guys all heard them before, and I think you can imagine that. And I think uh, one of the things that Vin loved is to laugh at himself. He didn't take himself too seriously. So anything like that, I think he kind of appreciated. So I think, I think you know, um, you'll have a lot of questions now. Sure. Um, first of all, I love the title of the book because he spoke so well. And if you were to have a chapter with me in it, my appreciation, I just loved listening to him without a color man. He was just fabulous. There was no shtick like yep. most of these guys have today. He was storytelling. He spoke great. And he really, he look, he loved the Dodgers, but he really did not <laughs> act as a homer. He really didn't. Uh, that's oh, and that, that's and my kind of, take from yeah, it. That set a standard almost for every broadcaster who was in Los Angeles. So you, you couldn't, if you were kind of strayed from that, you were called a homer, which Chick Hearn might have been with the Lakers calling games. But being taught at the uh, at the at the knee of Red Barber, he was kind of uh, uh, learned how to be a reporter more than just a, a broadcaster and an announcer. And, and I think that sort of, <laughs> made him more credible so that when he told a story, when he had an opinion, it was more believable instead of somebody who was just so caught up in the language. And the language itself was something very important to him uh, growing up in Fordham and having this talk. Th this class was actually called Perfect Eloquence was the name of a broadcasting class at Fordham, which <laughs> kind of implies the, the structure that they felt was important for a broadcaster to have. Let the game, let the players tell the story instead of you be the story. Right. which is a, the essence of a credible journalist. So I think all that sort of comes together. And it's it's when he passed away a couple of years ago, I think uh, we all sort of took a pause and wondered how we could put together words that showed our appreciation. At the, I think that was the intent of the book. So I hope that comes across as well as all the important milestones in his career. Hey, how, Tom, how, how long? Tom how long? and Gary. I'm Gary. Yeah. Yeah, it's Jim Woods. Hey, Jim, how are you? Hey, I'm great. Uh, I, I just wanted to intercede here because before I lose it, uh, first of all, uh, Tom, I introduced you to Gary. Uh, I heard you at the Jonathan Club. Thank you. You were fantastic. And I knew that this was going to be a perfect pairing because <laughs> Gary is the effervescent, effervescent Giants fan, and he's written a fabulous book, too. I think everybody on the phone is has probably read it and it, and you should read it too. It is exceptionally good. But having said all that, my wife and I, I'm a basically a Northern California guy, lifelong Giants fan, but for family reasons, moved to SoCal. And I was, I'm a member of the Jonathan Club and I attended your presentation. And one of the first games we went to uh, recently was the Giants Dodgers game on uh, June 22nd. And as we're sitting down uh, behind home plate, we saw a video on the screen of Vince. Uh, I don't know if you saw that game. It was the quintessential class act of the Dodgers honoring Mays, honoring the Giants, and in celebration of his life, they gave about a three to five minute video of Vince talking about Willie Mays and the greatest catch, not the catch that we all remembered, but a catch that he thought was the greatest catch, which was different than the over the shoulder one. And it went on. And then the two teams lined up on the sidelines. And I said, my God, this is what <laughs> baseball is all about. This is absolutely fantastic. And I, I give great credit to the Dodgers for doing that, uh, honoring, you know, our hero, uh, Willie Mays. So on behalf of the Dodgers, thank you. And uh, and I love your book, too. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, yeah. Like you said, that presentation, that tribute to Mays was almost 50 years after the one I saw at the stadium while he was still a player. So they had such a, a great respect for each other. Yeah. They made they made each other better. Hey, Jim, nice meeting you, by the way. Hey, it's about time, right? <laughs> Gary and I go back and forth and back and forth, but I, I haven't joined the Zoom for God knows what other stupid excuses I have. Uh, this is fantastic, and I hope to participate more often, but I don't want to hog the limelight. Just uh, 
uh, others, I'm sure, have plenty to say. Thank you, Jim. Uh, Tom, I just had a couple of quick, quick ones. How long did the book take and why did you choose him? Well, I'd known him for so long as a as a sports reporter. I, my beat was the sports and the media. So I'd known him since 1992 was the first time I sat down with him to talk about things. And I couldn't believe what a gentleman he was and all the time that he gave me. And I grew up in Los Angeles. So the first 30 years of my life was just growing up thinking of him as another part of the family. So when uh, when he passed away, I thought I had all these interviews and pictures and things collected. And I just wanted to kind of pull them all together. Um, so the book took not that long to pull together. Um, and by the time I reached the June 2023 deadline for it, um, I realized I had 67 essays pulled together. I swear I did not plan on that at all. And the fact that it matched up with the number of seasons he did, I thought was pretty pretty much karma. I think there was a greater power kind of steering this together. So that a book takes about a year to come out. And so that's uh, it, it just came out this past May and it's been great ever since. And two other real quick ones. Yep. Vin, Vin or Vince? I see it different places. Does it matter? Or I see you use Vin on in. I, on I've never I've never heard Vince until uh, actually uh, a couple people like Magic Johnson, who is now a Dodger team owner, says Vince quite a few times. I never understood why he, it was Vince. It was either Vin or Vinny is really what it was. I mean, it was probably more Vinny than any anything else. And, and the last question. Uh, when did uh, Welcome to Dodger Baseball begin? I think that just came once while he was doing a, an opening to a game, and it just kind of stuck. He just kind of liked the way it sounded, probably in the 70s or 80s. And I think that when you go to games now at Dodger Stadium, you hear his voice. It's kind of like Walt Disney's recorded voice at Disneyland. It kind of hey, Welcome to the ballpark. Here's the rules. Here's fan B and it's like, it's just walking back in time when you come in there. So it's a, I, the, the other thing I, I think is interesting about Ben is he became so relatable and so trustworthy that he became uh, a, a product pitch man for so many things, which is what John Miller loves to imitate him for farmer, John Dodger dogs and things. Yeah. And I grew up, everybody in Los Angeles grew up thinking farmer, John Dodger dogs were just the best thing ever, even though we didn't know any better. But that it just led to, to Union Oil Gasoline and everything became something that was, if you banked on Vin to, to promote your product, I think you couldn't have had a better spokesperson. Wonderful. Yeah. Uh, Joe, Joe Margolin, do you, do you want to say something? Unmute, Joe, you first. Joe, you want me to come back to you or you know it? No. There you go. Go ahead, Joe. No, I'm just I'm just sitting, enjoying what I'm hearing, and uh, every every time one of these guys is and gals speak, uh, I go back to it, uh, <clears throat> an earlier time. <laughs> don't 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 get too sentimental, Joe. <laughs> no, I understand where I am, Gary, and I'm happy I have the machine here to protect me. I know that these are basically vicious people. And uh, went after my childhood heroes with everything they could. So, uh, what is what is your best remembrance of Vince Scully? Vince Scully, I just like uh, every memory. Listening to him all the time in those days, Gary had things called they were radios. I don't know if you've ever heard of a radio, <laughs> and uh, we had our imagination. And uh, Vince Scully took care of it. I actually was lucky. I, 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 I went to a lot of Dodger games as a kid, and uh, I spent a lot of time at Ebbets Field. I didn't go to the polo grounds because my parents did have standards. Uh, so that... <laughs> All right. You might have to be muted now because, you know, you started. You started <laughs> oh, crying. no, no. These guys know they have an advantage. I, I resent that remark. <laughs> and, I, and I'm happy they resent it because at least they know that some of us are still alive. Uh, in, in any case... Uh, it was a major part. I would Dodger baseball with the Giants. Now, of course, uh, I signed, I guess, many petitions saying that the Giants should not be allowed in the major leagues. But uh, the fact of the matter is, I thought Willie Mays. I thought Willie Mays <clears throat> was the greatest player ever. Thank you, Joe. Yep. Mars, you're up. Uh. 
thanks for joining us. That was that was great to hear stories about Vince Scully. He might have been born Vincent, <laughs> but uh, I have a question and a couple of comments. Uh, in in perhaps his Vince Scully's memoirs, did he ever um, truly convert to a Dodger fan? After growing up as a Giant fan, and Melot was his favorite player. I don't think so. And and the, the interesting thing I found out about him, too, was he was a much bigger football fan than a baseball fan. And he enjoyed the years when he was calling games for CBS and was with uh, John Madden for a little while and Hank Stram. And he did the catch, the 49ers famous game. But I, I think he still stayed loyal to Giants because it reminded of him his childhood. And one of the great gifts that was was given to him at, at, toward the end of his career was a uh, the Dodger team historian Mark Langell found a, an authentic uh, New York Giants cap and gave it to Vin and and Vin I think really appreciated it because again like you guys it's something close to your your heart and it brings you great memories and I don't think Vin ever wanted to let go of that feeling of Mel Ott as being his favorite player and and all those games he spent at the Polo Grounds because of CYO tickets and things like that so um I, I think he admired the Dodgers and their history, and he knew he was part of it, and he admired the O'Malley family. But I think uh, down deep down, he still was a Giants he, because of the fact that he saw that uh, that as a kid saw the Giants losing that game in the World Series and felt sorry for them and really had empathy for them, and that really was started his connection. Oh wow! Uh, you you mentioned uh, the last game played at the Polo Grounds. That was on my tenth birthday, and I was <laughs> at that game. <laughs> wow. Uh, the, the other game you mentioned was the great catch in 1952 at Ebbets Field. Right. Uh, I, I don't remember if, if Carl Erskine pitched that game or he mentioned that when we had him as a guest. But for what I heard, the description of the catch was he went all the way down close to the left field line and made the catch horizontally. Uh, that that's that's uh, and it might have bumped into the concrete wall and all that, uh, wow. but that's what I heard about the that uh, this description, and uh, off of uh, I guess Morgan Bobby Morgan hit the ball, um, and let's see what I have. Uh, well, I guess that that was it. That just Earth can, those... Earth can actually pitch seven innings of relief in that game. And and I think that line drive that Mays caught was off of Erskine. I th yeah, I think so. Yeah. Thank you very much. Sure. Hey, Tom, just for your edification, we had Carl Erskine do a Zoom with us about the giant Dodger rivalry. Wow. 96 people showed up. Oh, that's great. So that's I'm great. not disparaging you. As we have a great crowd in here. <laughs> so you're aware. Howard Manis, you are up. How you doing, Tom? Great, Howard. Good. Uh, I think all of us have seen at least once, probably many times, the Gibson home run in the World Series, where uh, Scully went absolutely crazy. I can't believe what I just saw, whatever it was. So I would probably guess off the top of my head, not knowing, not being a Dodger fan, not being in L.A., that must have been one of the greatest uh, broadcast moments he's ever had. Uh, now, I happened to be at the Buckner game, the 86 World Series. So I missed the broadcast. I'm glad I missed it. I'd rather have been at the stadium uh, that had to be, I would say he probably ranked that way up there too. Uh, maybe you would agree with me. Uh, I was just wondering out of curiosity, how do you think he would have reacted to Freddie Freeman's home run uh, <laughs> against the Yankees? I'm, I'm trying to imagine it had to be something like uh, the Gibson thing, more so than the Buckner thing. Uh, so my question is really just an opinion. How do you think he would have called that? And were there other, any other great moments, maybe number three behind Gibson and Buckner uh, that he did during his career? Well, the great part about the, the Freeman home run grand slam was that Joe Davis was on the call and Joe being the Dodgers broadcaster later admitted that he'd sort of channeled Vin for that call by just saying she is gone when he, when he saw the ball leave the p field and then kind of referenced Gibson as well. And, uh, and the interesting part too that you mentioned is Joe Buck also made the great call of that Gibson home run on radio. And, and Joe Buck is actually the one who said, I don't believe what I just saw. While Ben was the one who just said, and in the ear of the. Jack, that was Jack Buck. Jack Buck. I'm sorry. Jack. Yeah. Joe Jack. Uh, yeah. yeah. 
But anyway, Jack had made that call on radio and it's still kind of a tri it's just two great broadcasters on two different mediums made that call. Um, I actually think Vin's greatest call and and I think he thought he was the most proud of it. And I think even John Miller has said this as well, was Hank Aaron's 715th home run in Atlanta. Just so happened the Dodgers were playing the Braves that night. Right. Just so happened the Dodgers televised the game because I think it was a national well, it was a national TV game. And I think Scully called it on the radio. So he was able to just describe the play, but then put that marvelous caption about, about how how great it is a black man in the South is yeah. has achieved this accomplishment. And I think that just still gives me goosebumps when I hear that maybe he had that prepared, but you know what? He just said it so eloquently and and such a perfect moment. So when when a play like the Buckner ground ball goes through and he's basically describing what's happening, but you hear it coming from his soul. He's so surprised at what's happening. That's why I think it resonates. But with the Aaron thing, it was just a time to pause and reflect on what had just happened after all these years of, of and especially at, at that time of the year, uh, in, in that period of time with the game, it was just such an important thing to do. And I, and I also think one of the most important things that Vin did uh, again, on a Dodger broadcast was after 9-11 happened, and there was probably a week to 10 games that were taken off, and baseball resumed, and Vin came on the top of the telecast in Los Angeles, and sort of, it looked like a presidential address. He was basically saying, we've been through a lot lately, we, we, you know, we, we've seen our freedoms challenge, we've seen a lot of, uh, of emotional times, and now it's we're going to try to play baseball again. And that, to me, that was just another sort of moment where he's the perfect guy to kind of bring everybody back and put perspective on things. And so uh, the, the more of those kind of moments that happen, I mean, he's he'll, he'll he's called, you know, 20 no hitters and perfect games and all sorts of things. But it's moments like that that really you sort of look at and you remember as that was a, a really pivotal point in in our country's history. And he was kind of there to help set the table for it. Did he do the uh, when uh, Marischal hit uh, Roseboro with the bat? Was he broadcasting that day? He should have been. I don't. I've never seen a, a broadcast of it. Just the clips and some of the video. But he should have been there too. But you're you're right. It's probably worth looking up to see how he described it. Um, I think it was a game that was televised back to Los Angeles. One of those few games. Mm -hmm. um, but that's a that's a perfect uh, one to bring up too. Okay. One last quick question. Uh, mm -hmm. a hypothetical again. How do you think he would have reacted getting back to the World Series uh, of this year with those fans trying to take the ball out of uh, Mookie's glove? <laughs> do you think he would have been outraged or would he thought it was funny or, you know, really? How no, do you no, think I, I think would have he would have been upset by it. I, I Again, I think, I think about the time where he described, I mean, not to put the two the, the parallel, but the time he described when two fans came on the field and tried to burn an American flag. And it just kind of appalled yeah. him that people would have that kind of reaction or that kind of you know, nerve to try to do something like that. I, I don't think he would have laughed it off. And I, I do think that he would have uh, thought, you know, uh, people are better than this. You don't have to be that way. And maybe the next day after it, after more of the story came out, he would have revisited it. But I, I don't think he would have put up with things like that. And of course, he also saw when Hank hit the home run, those two fans that ran on the field as uh, Aaron circled the bases. I mean, people, some people freaked out when they saw that because, it was down south. You just don't sure. know what would have happened. So that must have been another moment, a uh, memorable one for him. So, Thanks, um, uh, Howard, thank by you. the way, by the way, hey, Gary, put he, me online. Yes, I will, Fra uh, Frank. Howard, the quote for the Gibson home run by Scully was, in a year that has been so improbable, the impossible has happened. Mm -hmm. That was the quote. Yep. Uh, Ken, you are up. Thank you. Thank you, okay. Gary. Go ahead. Uh, appreciated it, Tom. Uh, nice presentation. You use the word soulful, and that's a word that I was usually. I grew up with a bunch of Irish storytellers, and Scully seemed to be in that mode, and it usually came from a real soulful sort of place. And and I think baseball is a soulful experience, so I think it was just perfect, and and it fit wonderfully. Now I grew up with Lon and Russ as a San Franciscan, first game in '58, of course, and. 
Love that. So I was prepared not to like Scully because all my Southern <laughs> California friends in college were telling me, you know, this great man and everything. And of course, when I heard him, I knew that they were right. But but still, it was always hard for me to admit it and things like that. But um, but it, it was interesting, too, that you started talking about the product placement. I'll go there for a minute, if you don't mind. Um, when I grew up with those Southern California friends in college, so it was from 66 to 70, they were all talking about Scully all the time. And I noticed that the three of them, my three best friends from Southern California, they all smoked Terrytons. And I'm almost positive that was because that was what what the Dodger broadcasters were pushing on the air and things <laughs> like that. And la later on, I wrote a piece about something else about beer and baseball. And it always resonated with me because at Seal Stadium in San Francisco, where I actually played a game once, there was a Ham's Brewery right next door and the right. wafting right. of the beer would come across. Right. And so I wrote a memoir about beer and baseball and tied that in. But in doing the research, it was interesting because I found out that, you know, if the Giants were pushing Ham's, Ham's brew, beer and stuff like that. But I read about all the things that I didn't know about back in New York and Brooklyn that I guess it was Valentine's Ale that Mel Allen pushed or somebody from the Yankees. But apparently, uh, apparently Scully was really tied with Schaefer's Brewery or Schaefer's Beer. And he was a sponsor then. Can you speak to any of that? You have spoken a little bit about the sponsorship, but literally I saw with my three SoCal friends how influential he was. And literally <laughs> what they smoked probably was because they liked him as a broadcaster so much and were emulating. Yeah, what, again, yeah, what being the, the trustworthy spokesman that he was. And I, I, if you go back to 1950 when he first started, he was still working with, with, with Red uh, Barber. And Tom Volante was his producer, his TV producer. Um, and Tom is actually somebody I tracked down for the book. So he told me about being the probably the only person to work with both Red Barber and Vin Scully. And the reason Tom Volante was the producer was because he worked for this ad agency that was the two biggest uh, uh, the two biggest companies that were involved. His two biz biggest clients were Schaefer's and Lucky Strike Smokes. And so, yeah, there's there are pictures of Ben in the at Ebbets Field. One classic one, he's in the dugout talking with Gil Hodges and the team. He's holding a cigarette in his hand, and he was a smoker for a, a while until he decided to quit. And one of the ways he quit, as described in the book, is that it, if he had put a pack of cigarettes in his pocket, he instead put a a picture of his family in his pocket. So then whenever he reached for that, he would see the picture of his family. He would be reminded why he's really quitting smoking. Um, but it, as much as beer and cigarettes were the driving sponsors for most of those early games, you just kind of saw it evolve where those were taken out of play. And now I, I just, it, it, I, I'm so glad we don't have to see Vin doing ads for sports gambling or DraftKings and things like that. It would just completely tarnish what he was all about. And and there was even at a time um, when he had to do promos on Fox for Fox Sports had this show called The Best Damn Sports Show, period. And he wouldn't do it. He just said, I'm not using the word damn. <laughs> I mean, as simple as that, that's just was part of his morals. And so he would always figure out a way to worm around that that uh, uh, obligation to do a promotion for a show. Um, anyway, I hope that answers some of your questions. But it was it was interesting how beer and cigarettes were really the vices of the time, but also what was driving baseball broadcasts. Yeah, and you make a good analogy with the gambling today. But it's interesting because I I always wondered with that that wonderful voice. I've always wondered if he himself smoked or not, but so you answered that for me. So I appreciate yeah, that. Yeah, just thankfully Thank not too much. <laughs> Thank you, Ken. Harvey Weinberg, you're up. Tom, thank you very much for sure. giving us a conversation about the great Vin Scully. I grew up in New York. Uh, Vin was doing Dodgers games. Red Barber, by the time I started listening, was doing Yankees games with Mel Allen Russ Hodges was on the Giants. We had Hall of Fame announcers here in New York. And what I was able to do with my MLBTV.com subscription was I could switch back and forth between Giants and Dodgers. And then there was a replay the next game, and I used to flip on and listen to Vin. And he had a uh, – I think it was in the fifth inning where he would do – 
he would come on the screen and he would give a discussion and he would hearken back to the days in New York, in Brooklyn and New York. He, would, he always kept that connection. Um, I also seem to recall when he retired and he did his last game from whatever the name of the Giants ballpark is, and he was in the, the booth, he, he turned to the – and then Willie was in the booth and John, and all the Giant announcers were there, and Vin said, well, now that I'm retired, I can revert to my one childhood love, the Giants. I'm going to root for the Giants. I don't know if he really did that, but it was a wonderful coda on, on his day uh, at the ballpark that day. By the way, Gary, I hate to correct you, but he doesn't say, the, the recording is, he doesn't say welcome. He says, it's time for Dodgers baseball. Right. And, and he's got this lilt to his, his voice. Um, I just want to dwell a little bit on, the, on his call of Hank Aaron's home run. That is a, whether he, I, I didn't even think that he wrote it in advance. It's funny that Tom, you opine that he might have written that out in advance, but it, it is it is a great commentary. It hit the it hit the the point right on the head. I think the line is I didn't look it up for this, but the line is a black man is getting a standing ovation in the deep south, and and that was 1974, if I'm not mistaken. 74. And. Um, that's uh, 50 years ago, if my arithmetic is correct. Um, and that was, a, 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 that was, well, we were still in troubled times, but that was a very troubled time. Um, Vince Gully uh, would not do, uh, and Bob Costas, I, I don't think, is doing, uh, I know mean, he's just retired, but I don't think he did gambling uh, website commercials. No. And I don't think Vin would have done it either. Um, Thank you very much, and um, Harvey. Thank both. you for Harvey. Thank you for correcting. That was. Okay. Well, I'm sorry, Mr. Mintz. I hope you won't send me to detention. Uh, I, <laughs> should send my, I should send myself to detention. <laughs> I also, I also, it, it just reminded me. I wanted to bring up in that uh, Ernie Hardwell. Ernie Hardwell was a Dodger broadcaster um, from 19. 19- can't remember when he came but he, he was there till 1949 and he left to do the new york giants and the dodgers brought scully in then and i asked ernie once what would have happened if he had stayed with the dodgers and scully would have taken that giants opening imagine scully doing the giants from the start and ernie thought that was a pretty cool thing to think about because harwell what he wasn't sure if he would have gone to la with the dodgers but he he thought vin was was good enough and young enough and uh he was not married until he you know moved to la but uh, there was that chance that uh, that Vin had a had, could have taken a Giants opening in 1950. Hmm. Dave Lipman, you're up. Dave, you, unmute, Dave. Dave. Yeah, I'm really enjoying this. Unfortunately for me, I only got to to hear of uh, Vin Scully when he was doing um, NBC's Game of the Week or when he was doing the postseason. And it was very interesting for me to to see and hear him do one portion of the postseason and then Cosell do the other portion of the po- portion of the postseason. So I'm curious. Um, the two things. One is what are his most memorable um, giant Dodger games? And the second thing is what did he think of Howard Cosell to <laughs> be sure? Because that guy was the worst baseball broadcaster <laughs> I ever saw. He clearly hated the game and had no idea what it was about. You know, I don't know if he actually said what his favorite Dodger Giant game was, but I, but from doing that research and finding out how crazy he realized he had become during the '62 playoffs, I think Matt's probably the one that's most memorable for him. And uh, I don't know if he even had a chance to work with Cosell because. Um, you know, back in those days, uh, the World Series would always bring in the local broadcaster. So if a Dodger Yankee World Series was happening, would be Scully would come on and Mel Allen would come on or somebody else. Um, so I don't know if they ever worked together, but I know Vin really appreciated the fact that he worked by himself so much because it 
created a better relationship with the audience. I don't think he naturally enjoyed working for a national broadcast like NBC, where Joe Gargiel was his partner for a long time. Uh, Sparky Anderson was his partner on radio. Jeff Torberg was also there. I think he enjoyed more when he could sort of set the pace and the storytelling, um, which he really did in the 1988 World Series game one with Gibson, because he was the one who told the producer, you know, take a look at the bench. Gibson's not there. Let's set the story. Let's start the story. And it was interesting how Gibson being in the in the clubhouse heard Scully saying Gibson's not on the bench and cursed through his bat down and says, I'm going to come up. I mean, it, it's hard to, to imagine that Scully actually created that moment, but in a way he kind of did. And even with Joe Garagiola there as his broadcast partner, he still had the presence of mind to sort of know that this was a big part of the story and whether he could sort of be part of it or not was remained to be seen. And it turned out that he did. You know, Red Barber really disliked both Garagiola and Rizzuto working with them. He thought that, uh, you know, Garagiola was just making jokes the whole time, was just a dumb guy, and Rizzuto, uh, you know, wasn't watching the game, as we all know. I was just wondering if uh, 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 also if, if uh, Vin had any thoughts on those guys. And also, what was his advice to somebody who wanted to be a, a, a baseball broadcaster? I mean, what would he say to them about, you know, this is how you learn to do it? Well, he had always said that he didn't listen to other broadcasters, which I, I don't know if that's true or not, or how he would actually watch a game without listening to the broadcast. But his advice always to people was to find your voice, find your authentic self, and do as much practice games as you can. So it wasn't really anything real technically specific. It was mostly don't try to imitate somebody else because imitation in, in broadcasting is not flattery. It's just you're just parroting somebody else. And eventually that's not who you are. So I think that uh, over the years, that's what I remember him saying the most to people. Interesting. Thank you very, 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 very much, Lee. Sure, <laughs> sure. Thank you, Dave. We're going to go Frank, Paul, Greg, and Bill Clink. Frank, you're up. Uh, first, uh, I want to thank uh, Tom for that great presentation. But uh, I was at the 1952 opening game between the Giants and the Dodgers at Evans Field. Um, and among the things that happened was that rookie giant pitcher, Floyd Wilhelm, got a home run on his first at bat and never got one again. <laughs> um, and um, now, what happened to prior Dodger announcers? Of course, Red Barber went with the Yankees, but uh, Connie Desmond, Jerry Doggett, and others I can't forget. And I have one other topic, although not, not part of not a topic of your book. Nowadays, who listens to radio broadcasts of baseball and other sporting events? Why is it? Why would anybody want to pay to advertise on it? And is it profitable for the radio stations? Uh, well, I listen to radio uh, broadcast all the time. Yeah, but how many people nowadays do? Uh, oh, you, when you can't get to a television, you listen to the radio. Yeah, but how much is there of those people? Don't know. Well, it's easier to listen to the car when you're stuck in traffic in Los Angeles, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what about the prior Dodger announcers? Uh, uh, Vin also, Vin, Vin was very good friends with Jerry Doggett, Ross Porter, Don Drysdale was a very popular broadcaster in Los Angeles too, but none of them would, would work together with Vin on the air. It was always one or the other on television, which was kind of not playing into Vin's strength because he was such a great radio broadcaster. So what happened a lot in Los Angeles was they would do a simulcast of the first three innings where Vin would basically be talking too much for radio or talk too much for television and not enough for radio, but still people, if you could get Vin, that was fine. You could take whatever you can get. So he kind of changed the medium in a lot of ways in, in how the Dodgers parceled off the the innings during the games but you also wanted him at the beginning to tell the stories and at the end to describe the 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 climax and in the middle they kind of left it to other people so uh whatever however much you could get vin on whatever the biggest platform was that's how it worked out thank you frank thank you paul you're up tom thank you so much what a great job today 
Um, I just say I have two questions. One is, uh, one is, did Vin Scully have a favorite announcer that he really loved? You know, in terms of doing baseball. And the other question is, when doing your work, were you able to get access or find the 1952 call that Vin did on Willie's catch in that 52 game where he uh, hit his head on the concrete? Um, I don't know the answers to either one of those, but um, in the midst of doing the research for the book, I think if I was doing more of a biography, I really would have worked harder to find those answers. Sure. But, okay. But it was more of a of a case of I was collecting essays and trying to get people's right. memories. But those are great points to make. I mean, I would love to see if those things even exist. Um, and I don't mm -hmm. remember who there wasn't very many broadcasters doing sports of, of of great importance when he was growing up as a kid. So it was right. Uh, yeah. It it was basically two or just two or three guys. So you know he kind of took things to the next level with with Red Barber right. as his guide. Or, or the other question might be, is there, was there a broadcaster, a fellow broadcaster that he truly admired? That might be another. I, I think one of, if, well, I'll look at it this way. When he passed away, there was only about 100 people invited to his funeral. And uh, one of them was Tom Brenneman. So maybe that was, he. Maybe. I think he enjoyed him as a friend and a broadcaster. Sure. Okay. Ooh, thank you, John. Sure. Thank, thank you, Paul. Greg, you were up. <laughs> Hi, Tom. I really enjoyed that presentation. Um, Vin's, Vin's story about seeing Sandy Koufax the first time is really is a really good story. And his calls of Sandy Koufax's games are classic. Um, Vin and Vin and Sandy seem to really like each other. How were you? Did you were you able to work any of Sandy Koufax's stories into your book? Well, I tried to contact him through different people and he's um, you know, pretty private person. And it's hard to get him on a good day or a bad day. So I, I just kind of took what I could from him. But I know uh, there's been a couple books done on Sandy and, and talking about relationships with different people. But I think the interesting thing to me was when I was collecting essays, uh, Bob Costas wanted to point out that when he was a kid, he got this book and included Ben's call of Koufax's Perfect Game in 1965. And it reads like a poem, almost the way it, it it's transcribed. And Costas was struck about what great writing that was and then didn't realize till later that that was actually taken from a live a description. So I, it's interesting, too, in Los Angeles, people think that Sandy Koufax might be the greatest sports athlete in the city's history. But I think without Vin Scully, that might not be the case because Vin really created Sandy Koufax in a lot of ways in describing his games, but also putting some sort of awe involved in it. Um, so the two paralleled their careers a lot and, and they, oh, I, I think for sure, I think the, uh, that an announcer like Ben Scully can, can, can help really, uh, how you, how you remember games. I mean, he, they, he, they really affect how you remember things, how you remember games and how you take them in. Uh, there's yeah. no question about that. One of the, the stories uh, that Steve Garvey gave me for the book was that he was a young third baseman and he was having a bad game. He was up in September, made a couple of errors. And in Dodger Stadium, you could hear the transistor radios all around, just like in the Coliseum. And all he could hear was Vin talking about, instead of, you know, kind of pointing out the mistakes, he just said something like, you know, there's a great young third baseman. He's trying his best. And I think someday he'll be a great player. And Steve basically said, Mr. Scully kind of saved my career from being, you know, turned on by the fans who might have thought that this was just some rookie who was, who was heading for nowhere. But uh, Vin had that kind of power in in informing the fans but also the players could hear all that too but yeah he didn't make it to the senate thank you tom i real thanks tom i really oh, enjoyed sure. it. thanks bill clank you're up hey tom i uh appreciate talking to you i think uh gary had reached out to you i have one of my best friends now passed away uh was ed hoffarth uh you're not related i understand uh, he's, <laughs> I a, he's a buffalo hoffarth <laughs> They're all Buffalo Hoffars, um, but a great guy. And and you 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 do the name of the family's name well. <laughs> I, I hold you both in high esteem. I wanted to go back to the the, the flagship stations for uh, 
the Dodgers. And I don't remember the first two years. It was a it was what I call a local station. It it just broadcast in the area. But I think in 1960 they made the decision to go with KFI and Earl C. Anthony Company. You'll remember that from the broadcast. And and of course that went all the way up and down the West Coast. It was a north south beacon. And they were 50,000 watts. And so you, you, but they didn't go east west. It, it wasn't like KMOX back in St. Louis. They went north south. But, you know, all over the West Coast, there were people like me in the Bay Area no. who otherwise really would have never heard Vin, but we heard him. Do you, did he have any, did he have any influence or was there any talk, do you know, with him and the Dodgers over, hey, I'm on this local station uh, in, in L.A. in 58 and 59. And, and, you know, not many people are hearing me. But th when they went to KFI, everybody heard him. Did, was there any talk of that? Well, the great story about that is the first two years in Los Angeles, they were on KMPC yeah. 710. And that was a station that was owned by Gene Autry. And at the time, Gene Autry was trying to get his own Major League Baseball team. And he loved having the Dodgers as the flagship team for his station. And the story is that Walter O'Malley had a house up in Lake Arrowhead, up in the mountains, and he couldn't hear the games from his from his house up there. And so he was the one who said, we're getting off this station. Sorry, Gene. And as kind of, kind of as a consolation, they said, oh, by the way, we've got this American League team. We're looking for an ownership. Hank Greenberg fell out. He was going to do it, and uh, and so they gave the the team to Autry, who put the Angels on the station. But that was it was all a, a Walter O'Malley decision to get off the station. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I yeah. remember as a kid growing up listening to KFI games, and I was like every other kid with the transistor radio, falling asleep with the radio, and I would wake up at two in the morning, and I would hear this thing called Chuck Cecil's The Swingin' Years, and that was the thing that started at midnight. And so I was waking up to swing music all the time, and I couldn't understand why this was. And that was just what was on KFI overnight. Yeah. So those are it, it's odd memories that you have of baseball, but I'll still remember the Dodgers and swing music. Yeah. I what I remember, and I have only one personal memory of Vin Scully, and I mean, you know, this is called face to face Vin Scully. Um, I'm and Gary will back me up on this. I'm never at a loss for words. <laughs> that was one time I was totally at a loss for words. Somehow I got on the Dodgers elevator at Dodger Stadium. I'm sure that's off limits to everybody now, but not really, was, not really. Yeah, not really. No, Mid still. Yeah. you know, I got on the elevator. There's one guy on the elevator, <laughs> it's Vince Scully. <laughs> I mean, all the questions I could have asked him, all, I was I was totally <laughs> speechless. Hamada, 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 right? <laughs> and, and all I said was, I, I hope you have a, a, a wonderful evening, Mr. Scully. Not Vin, not Vin Mr. Scully. Um, so that that's my, my, my story on that. Game two of the playoffs, I rushed home to watch that on TV uh, in, in the Bay Area. And, and I certainly remember it. I didn't remember a lot of, uh, well, obviously not knowing about Vin and, you know, him taking out his <laughs> his emotions on the side of the wall there. Uh, but uh, I, I didn't remember about Tom Haller being knocked out. And I guess that's why Baylor was in that game. And I guess game, and he, he, Bailey caught game three as well. They They were lefty catchers. I never could understand the Giants, you know, what? They have not lefty-righty catchers. They got two left-handed catchers, <laughs> hitting catchers. I, I don't know. They, 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 they liked them both. But what I like, and I have to show all the Giants fans, I have to show you. I don't know how close you can see it there. The, I got this for Christmas 1962 from my wow. mother. And this is the uh, Chronicle. For, uh, the headline and the chronicle from the day after they won the uh, the uh, playoffs. And, and of course it reads, Giants win miracle, incredible four run ninth brings flag the candlestick. <laughs> it, 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 it went above the, uh, uh, above the headline on perfect flight. Wally Sherrar got pushed down obviously <laughs> in the San Francisco <laughs> papers. That day. Thank you. I, I've had this that long and I'll have it until the day I die. <laughs> Thank you very much.
thanks for putting up you with know us. the great thing too about ben when when he would meet people and he they he could understand they would be sort of in overwhelmed by the situation he was usually one to put them at ease and that was always the way that people remember that their encounters with him where he would just say what kind of day are you having what what do yeah, you think is going to happen tonight nice and that was me. really that was just so nice of him yeah, tom do you have time for a few more absolutely thank you wonderful norm coleman and then ed norm tom, th thank you so much this has been a great a great session thank you so much um the funny thing for me is I had a couple of things I wanted to bring up. One was KFI and one was the perfect game call. And I didn't raise my hand until right before Greg spoke. <laughs> no one had brought either of those things up because I think the perfect game call is his greatest call because it was obviously unscripted. And it, as you said, it was poetry. It was beautiful. And KFI um, in the 60s, the Dodger games were very important to the Giants. You know? And so... We could get KFI up here in San Francisco at night. And so we listened to, to Vin call the games. And the funny thing is, someone talked about Vince and Vin in the 60s. I always knew of him to be Vince. No kidding. It wasn't until the yeah. 70s when all of a sudden he turned into Vin. Um, I could be wrong about that, but that's the way I always thought it was. He was yeah. Vince Scully. Um, I do have one short um Vin's story and that is at the Giants games on Sundays they have the kids run the bases after the ball games and so on those days fans can stay in the ballpark longer and so um I'm watching the kids run the bases but at the same time where I sit I can see in the Dodgers broadcast booth and the entire time I'm fixated on Vin Scully because I'm waiting for him to end his broadcast and leave. Because when he leaves, I know where he's gonna be walking out. And so I waited, saw him leave, went and met him at the door where he'd come out. So I wanted his autograph. And he was the ultimate consummate gentleman, um, including thanking me for asking him for his autograph. <laughs> right. So, um, it was a wonderful, wonderful experience but to take it one step further, so that's a Sunday. The following Saturday, I walked up to Lon Simmons and said, excuse me, may I have your autograph? And he said, you must be mistaking me for Vin Scully. <laughs> 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 to which I said, no, I got Vin's autograph earlier this week, and this is far more exciting. <laughs> 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 Only because I, I love Vince, I love Lon Simmons. But back to the perfect game. Here comes, I'm leading up to my question now. Back to the perfect game call. There was a very terrible movie called For Love of the Game. And the only thing to me that makes that movie worth watching is Vin Scully calling Billy Chappell's perfect game. As a matter of fact, I one time cut the movie up into pieces that just had him calling the game. Because in my opinion, his calling of that perfect game is the greatest part of baseball movies ever. Yeah. It was just so perfect. And it so wasn't he, scripted. That was just him talking. He he was given some clips and that's he said, just let me wing it. And he did. That's what I wanted to know. I wanted to know yeah. your insight onto that. In fact, it, it was Brent Shire, who wrote an essay for the book, was the technical advisor on the movie because he was with the Dodgers then and, and went with Vin. And the funny part to me was that they paired Vin with Steve Lyons as a color man in the movie. And Steve basically says nothing. And he knows he knows better to say nothing. He's just there as a as a because people are used to seeing two guys in a booth. But it's all Vin's language and it's all Vin first take. And to to come up with the words, you know, in, a, in a cathedral like Yankee Stadium, Billy Chapman, it's like, who else could make you? A writer couldn't write that. It's it's all because of Vin putting those thoughts together. So uh, there's there's a great Kevin Costner interview, too, as well, uh, where he says about how that whole those whole scenes came together. And Vin would do a take. He'd look at Kevin. Kevin would go, this is great. And the producer director would say, could you do that one more time? And Vin would say, yeah, do we really have to? You know, he goes, all right, I'll just do it one more time. But 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 Kevin was just amazed at what Vin would could how he could pull that off just in one take. Well, thank you, Tom. 
Yeah, yeah, that's a great uh, movie to talk about because we talked about the two at the Jonathan Club and it was great to have Brent there to kind of give some background on it as well. So that's one of my favorite stories just about how Vin, the, the interesting part about Vin is that he could have been a great broadcaster in any city, but being in Los Angeles, the media market that he was, having a star on the Walk of Fame, the fame never got to him. He just kind of rolled with that as well. And he, he didn't want to be part of Hollywood, but he was in so many ways because he had He hosted game shows and was was doing a lot of other hosting of things. But uh, it was just funny how he went through that period of being a national broadcaster. And then he's still remembered as the local guy. Thank you, Norm. Uh, Ed Freer, wrap it up before I uh, conclude. Unmute, Ed. Just a simple question, and uh, what I remember of Vince Scully, among other things, is, is, quote, pull up a chair. Did that make it in the book at all, or does anybody else know what I'm talking about? Yeah, if that no. was just kind of a catchphrase if there if he had any, and I don't know where that came from. Um, it. It's the name of a book that was done about him by Kurt Smith, who's a big baseball broadcaster historian. That's the name of that book. So if you Google pull up a chair, you'll find that biography. Well, he did uh, I don't know where it came from, but it was one of the World Series games. He would say that. Yeah. Pull up a chair. Right. And that made it feel great. <laughs> it, it was. You know, the one thing I wanted to ask everybody, too, before we wrap up is if anybody remembers the game between the Dodgers and the Giants and 1959 at the Coliseum where Willie Mays hit a long ball down the line and it got stuck in a girder that was holding up the big uh, wire fence. And uh, there's, there's a great record recording of Vin calling that play because uh, the umpire originally called it a double. And then Bill Rigney came out and argued and the home plate umpire overturned him and ruled it a home run. And then Walter Alston came back out and he argued and they called it, a, they compromised and called it a ground rule double. Mm -hmm. And uh, Vin's description of Bill Rigney and everybody else just uh, arguing over this thing is, it almost sounds like a Marx Brothers movie, just the way Vin um, described how Walter Alston made his argument like a Philadelphia lawyer and, and Bill Rigney is ready to eat his glasses and this thing. So if you can find that somewhere, uh, it's it's worth a listen. And again, it's it's Scully and Willie Mays coming together in a moment of baseball that's just priceless. Thank you, Ed. Uh, Tom, uh, just two other things. Um, first of all, you know, with all his great calls, I always, when I think of Vin Scully, all I hear in my ear, and I was not young enough, I was uh, too young to remember, I just love the Two and two to Harvey Keen. That's like <laughs> yeah. one of my favorites. Yep. Yeah. And, and you mentioned uh, imitating is is not a good thing to him. Uh, did he talk to you at all about John Miller's parroting him? No, I I don't know if I ever asked him about it, but I bet if you found it, an interview that he did with it, I'm sure he was fine with it. And he probably had a good laugh at it because you you. In that case, that is that is uh, Vin never took himself so seriously that he couldn't have a good laugh about that. And John, man, nobody did a better than John. Uh, let's all give it up for uh, Tom Halforth. Just incredible. Tom, perfect eloquence, appreciation of Vin Scully. Where could they get this book? Most any book starts start with Amazon. They're selling it at a discounted price right now. It's still on the Amazon top ten of baseball books, but that's the place to start. Any bookstore just bought two copies while we were meeting. Oh, uh, cool. God bless you. <laughs> and is, is is this supposed to be Dodger Blue the the cover? It's a diff, It's a somewhat Dodger Blue. Yeah, here's a here's a better look at it. But uh, yeah, I also <laughs> want to thank uh, James Wood for steering me into tonight. I'm Tom, I'm very glad we uh, got to hook up. Did a great job tonight. Everybody thoroughly enjoyed this, that I can tell you. And please do not, uh, don't be a stranger, okay? Uh, as Vin would say, thank you to the New York Giants Marching and Chowder Society. <laughs> and, you, <laughs> and you could also see that despite most of us being Giant fans, we do admire greatness and there was nobody better than him. Oh, and, and there's nobody today better I'd rather listen to than the giant, the giant guys, Kruko and 
and and just Tom Miller's fabulous. Hyper. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, we will uh we will reconvene on the December 5th. Everybody have a great uh Thanksgiving, healthy and happy. Uh I'm gonna shut off the recording. If anybody anybody wants to talk giant baseball, we'll hang out for a little bit. Have a great night, everybody. Be well. Thanks, Gary. Thank you, Tom.